G'day everyone and welcome to Inside Rugby with Mark and in this video I'm going to be doing a full debrief of all the Champions Cup games that took place over the weekend. So let's get into it right now. G'day everyone and welcome to the channel. If you haven't been here before, my name is Mark. I'm a Kiwi rugby fan who's living here in beautiful Cancun in Mexico. And today we've got plenty of birds around joining us here in the park. So uh, don't get too distracted with those. Now I'm going to go through all the Champions Cup games from the weekend. And boy, wasn't there some great rugby being played. And one of the things that I love doing is looking back on your predictions from the weekend. So why don't we start off this video by doing that and we have a look at the community poll that I posted last week before these games took place and just see who you thought were going to win each of these games. Through those lists now and have a look at what you decided was going to happen over the weekend or what you thought was going to happen over the weekend. And in the first game between Bordeaux and Harlequins, we had 58% of you thinking that Bordeaux was going to win that game. And of course, 42% thought that Harlequins were going to win that game. Next up was Leinster versus La Rochelle. This game, of course, was played at the Aviva Stadium in Dublin. 78% of you thought Leinster was going to win that game, and 22% of you thought La Rochelle was going to win that game. Next up was Northampton versus the Bulls. And this was an interesting one for me because 45% of you thought that uh, Northampton was winning, going to win this game. 55% of you picked the Bulls, even though the Bulls had what many considered to be a B team. And then on to the last game this weekend, and it was between Toulouse and Exeter Chiefs, of course, being played in France. And 88% of you thought that Toulouse was going to win that game and 12% were Exeter. So there's the community polls and what you thought was going to happen over the weekend. Now let's get into what actually did happen. And the first game, of course, was between Bordeaux and Harlequins. And boy, what a game this was. Absolutely thriller. And aren't Harlequins playing good rugby at the moment? And uh, as many of you had predicted, you thought Bordeaux, Bordeaux was going to win this game. Now, as this game got underway, it was obvious to me that the strategy that Harlequins were trying to put on Bordeaux was to run them around as much as possible and take a lot of energy out of those forwards, in particular for Bordeaux. And I thought that was a really, really good strategy from the, the uh, Quins in this game. And uh, we saw a very early try as well from Porter. He started off having a fantastic game and kept that going. And before long, we saw Tyron Green going in for their second try to the Quinn so they got out to an early lead and I think this really gave them a lot of good momentum in the game they were playing very very well they were expansive but they were earning the right to go forward and that's what I liked about the Quinn's forwards they were doing a very very good job against Bordeaux so Quinn shot out to a 14-0 lead Garcia got a yellow card for uh, Bordeaux being a little bit silly there and he got sent off for 10 minutes so that did give Quinn's an advantage and I thought this was going to be a pivotal part of the game were they going to be able to run away with it and put some more points on the board because it really needed Bordeaux to step up and try and get some points back and that's exactly what they did. Maxime Luku went over for their first try and uh, brought the scoreboard back a little bit closer uh, 14 points to 5 at that stage. And uh, it was interesting by the time we got to half time in this game because uh, Bordeaux had scored another try Romain Buros had got into the play and he was playing fantastic from fullback for Bordeaux but Evans went over for a good try for Harlequins before half time so they actually went to the half time break at 28 points to 12 and I thought Harlequins were playing really really good rugby in this game they were expand playing expansive rugby but they were taking Bordeaux on in the forwards as well and doing very very well I thought both in the set pieces as well as in the breakdowns and there were some good point outs there from Quinns as we headed into half time. The question mark was going to be though were Quinns were going to be able to keep this pressure on for 80 minutes or were Bordeaux going to be able to come back in the second half. So I thought the next team that scored was going to get some real momentum in this game and it was a fantastic try by Nicolas Di Porteri for the Bordeaux team. He picked up the ball on his toenails basically and uh, ran to the line to score a brilliant try. It was really a really good try by Di Porteri and it really showed that Bordeaux were back into this game. 
and uh, shortly afterwards they got a penalty to Luku as well which brought the score back to 28-22 and I thought this was going to be a really really pivotal moment in the game but we saw a great play by Quinz and Dombron went over for a fantastic try for them and that was able that gave them the ability to stretch out the lead in this beginning of the second half Marcus Smith had his kicking boots on so he got the conversion over and before we knew it we had the uh, Harlequins team out to a 35 points to 22 lead and uh, it was getting very very exciting in this game both teams were having momentum shifts throughout the game in the second half even though Bordeaux had started the second half I thought a little bit better Quinns came back and put a lot of pressure on them as the half unwound so a missed tackle by Quinns on um, Buros set uh, Biel Berri away down the line for a fantastic try and as I've mentioned in many of my videos that include Biel Berri in any of the games that he plays in he's a very very slippery character indeed but Buros set this one up for him fantastic play from Bordeaux and they were in for a, another try so they're really getting back into this game and uh, the last 15 minutes of this game were going to be helter skelter Madouche Tamwi came on for Bordeaux and he injected some pace and some real skill into this Bordeaux backline and he scored a try in the 65th minute of the game this is when Bordeaux hit the lead for the very first time and what happened next was Lewis Liner set up a brilliant pass for Tyron Green to go in for another try for the Quins put them back in the lead and we were staring down the barrel of a very exciting finish in this game between Bordeaux and Harlequins. So by the time Quinns had scored that try and there was converted by Marcus Smith, they were in the lead 40 to 36 and it looked like Quinns might be able to hold out Bordeaux in the last few minutes, but Bordeaux had something else to say. It was that man, Tamboui, who got in for another try and uh, it put them within one point of the Harlequins score. It was 42 points to 41. Maxime Luku had the kick and uh, probably one of those kickers in the world rugby today that you probably wouldn't want to have kicking with so much pressure on to win a game and unfortunately Luku missed this kick for Bordeaux and Quinns ended up having a magnificent victory against Bordeaux in this game winning by 42 points to 41 absolutely thriller and uh, it was a very very good game of rugby for Bordeaux in a losing team, I thought they had outstanding players in Roman Buros. This guy's only played once for France, and they've got a plethora of great fullbacks in France. So let's make, uh, well, let's keep an eye on him because I think Fabian Gaultier will need to put him in one of the test matches coming up this year for France because he's been playing outstanding rugby all year. Di Porteri played very well in this game as well on a losing side and Biel Biari looked his normal dangerous self whenever he got the ball and he also goes looking for the ball uh, on a lot of occasions as well. Standout forwards for me on the Bordeaux side Coleman at lock and Samu played very very well in a losing team. Over on the Quinn side we had a lot of good players playing for the Quins this weekend with outstanding performances. I thought Tyrone Green's performance at fullback was outstanding. He looked very dangerous when he got the ball He's a very deceptive runner, he's a smaller build but he gets through a lot of work and he's able to break the line on a lot of occasions, that's what he did in this particular game. Marcus Smith was good and uh, without being exceptionally brilliant at number 10 this weekend but it was Porter who scored two tries and played really really well at halfback that I would give the best player in the Quinns team this weekend. Also in the forwards for the Quins, I thought Dombron had a really good game, scored a try. Of course, Evans was also very good around the field and Cunningham himself, um, seen him play a lot of good games and of course had that call up for England as well in the year. Expect him to continue playing good rugby. It was all in the first half for those Quins forwards. They did very, very well. Bordeaux came back into it in the second half a little bit more by using those magical powers out wide. So there we go, the first game of the weekend. It was a standout game. Of rugby 42 points to Quinns against uh, 41 for Bordeaux could have gone either way in the end but uh, the Quinns got there in the end and they setting up a very exciting semi-final uh, in early May 
Okay, next up is the game between Leinster and La Rochelle, which was played at the Aviva Stadium in Dublin. It was good to see the sun out for this game and uh, a very good crowd in attendance as well. A lot of anticipation around this game, of course, with Ronan O'Gara coming back to Ireland for this one as the head coach of La Rochelle. But it was really interesting what Leo Cullen was doing with the uh, team from Leinster in this game. Unfortunately, Hugo Keenan pulled out just before the start of the game. And uh, we saw a bit of a rejiggle in the back line for uh, Leinster. But that didn't make any difference at all. And I think Leinster started off this game exactly the way that I thought they would. They were clinical, they were intense, and they were putting a lot of pressure on the La Rochelle team. And I thought before the game had got underway, if Leinster had come out and put that pressure on early, it was going to disrupt La Rochelle. And they were getting a lot of trouble getting the ball away, particularly from halfback where Kerr Barlow was taken out of play with the ball a couple of times and wasn't able to get the ball out to his back line in a quick fashion. So then he started putting up a few box kicks. That didn't work out too well for him either. And I think this game was won for Leinster really in the first 30 minutes. They put the pressure on, they were clinical, they got the points on the board. James Lowe again scoring two tries in this game. Fantastic performance from him. He's having quite a season, isn't he? A lot of people are talking about Gibson Park, of course, quite rightly so. But don't forget James Lowe. He's out having an outstanding game on the wing this year, both for Leinster and also for Ireland in the Six Nations. He's going to be a key component of the Irish team, I think, when they go to South Africa in July for that amazing series that we're all waiting for. So Leinster were having a good lead in this game heading towards half-time, but Pernverne went in for a good try for... La Rochelle and that put them back in touch on the scoreboard and I think when they went to half time I think Leo Cullen would have said to the boys look we're doing this well we've just got to keep the intensity on and we've got to get out there and we've got to really nail the beginning of the second half that was going to be crucial I thought in this game I didn't think La Rochelle had really turned up in that first half combination of two things first of all Leinster were playing very good rugby they were intense they were clinical they were going forward you could just see the energy levels within this Leinster team and that's what I really like about their style of play at the moment. When the breakdowns happen in the play, they're quickly to get in there and get the ball and get the ball moving. When they've got a set piece, they get organised, they look what they're doing, they communicate clearly and then they go and execute and that's a very, very good team that's communicating well and playing for each other and that's what this Leinster team are doing very very well. So I think O'Gara would have been happy going to half time by getting some respectability back into the scoreboard but I thought if Leinster scored early in the second half then they were probably going to run away with this game. That's exactly what happened and it was the try by Ryan Baird that really got this game in the bag I feel for Leinster. He scored that early in the second half. It put Leinster out to a healthy lead and from that time on La Rochelle didn't look like they were going to get back into the game. They suffered a terrible injury to Kerr Barlow, who had to got taken off on the little stretcher machine, the ambulance, the little way. Let's hope he recovers from that injury. And it was five tries scored by Leinster to tally up to their 40 points. James Lowe getting two of those. Gibson Park one. Ryan Beard, of course, that critical try. And that man, Dan Sheehan, another try on the wing for him this weekend. And uh, he likes spending a lot of time out there. So that's how the 40 points for uh, Leinster came up. And so for La Rochelle, from a scoring point of view, their 13 points were made up by a try to Pernverne. Hastoy got two penalties and one conversion. And they weren't able to score any more points. Now what I've been saying in my videos about Leinster is any team that wants to turn up to try and beat this Leinster team are going to have to score at least... 30 points and that seems to be a very very difficult task we saw it again in this game by La Rochelle they just weren't in the game to be able to score that many points Leinster's rush defense is very very good they've got too many good players across the field when it comes to their defense and uh, of course they were able to bring on someone like Josh Vanderfleer in the second half of this game amazing to have a guy of his quality on the bench but the likes of Kalen Doris Joe McCarthy they're all playing outstanding rugby at the moment and uh, it's going to be a, a mouth-watering semi-final and I'll talk about those a little bit later on in this video but a good win for Leinster at uh, the Aviva Stadium they go on to play at Croke Park next which is going to be exciting for all the fans of rugby to watch another game at Croke Park I want to make special mention in my video today of the Leinster team Ross Byrne I thought had a great game I think he won player of the match for the broadcasting unit um, I think James Lowe was unlucky not to get that, of course, by scoring two tries again today. But they gave it to Ross Byrne. 
but a standout player that I've been watching, I've mentioned him in a couple of my videos when we've been watching Leinster in the past, is o Osborne at uh, inside centre. I think he's a really, really good player. And of course, Ireland's got the plethora of uh, inside centres to play for their team, but Osborne hasn't put a foot wrong for Leinster. He looks very dangerous. He gets through the break line on a number of occasions, but he's also very good at feeding his outside backs, and we saw that again in this game. So a special mention from me about Osborne's performance in this game. Let me know if you noticed that as well, if you're a fan of Leinster. The final score from the Aviva Stadium in this game between Leinster and La Rochelle was 40 points to 13. A good win by Leinster sets up a mouth-watering semi-final and I'm going to be talking about that later on in the video. Okay, the next game up was the Northampton Saints against the Bulls and a lot of controversy around the Bulls team, of course, that had been selected for this game. Jake White had uh, probably made sure that a second string team had come through for this game, but a lot of people have been talking about that online, that a lot of players are injured and, uh, you know, this team is a good team that was sent along, but uh, I have to wait and see what I thought in the video on this game. Northampton haven't been through to the semi-finals of the Champions Cup since 2010. So they were looking at making a bit of history in this particular game against the Bulls. And I'm sure they were a little bit more motivated by seeing the Bulls line out in this game. But Saints have been playing really good rugby this year, so it didn't expect them to matter who they were playing against in this particular game. So the game got off to a great start, and uh, it was that man, Alex Mitchell, that went in for one of his two tries uh, scored in this game. And he was playing really, really well at halfback. I like Mitchell as a halfback, I must say that. I think he's played very consistently throughout his career and he brings a, a very good solid base of experience to the Saints team and that's exactly what they needed in this game against the Bulls. I thought the Saints were playing very well early on up front. They were taking it to the Bulls and they were really trying to disrupt through power play and also getting the ball and moving it quickly and that was tending to be the difference. I also thought the Northampton Saints were going to have more quality in the back line in this game if they were able to earn the right to go wide and that's exactly what happened as the game unfolded. In the first four minutes of this game, the Saints had shown their intentions and they put a lot of pressure on the Bulls. They were sitting in the Bulls half, putting a lot of pressure on attacking their line. And Alex Mitchell went over, but he got held up. So a near thing for the Saints on that occasion. And then after the fourth minute mark, it was the next four minutes was all the Bulls. They started coming back into the game, getting a bit of momentum, getting a bit of possession which allowed them to put a bit of pressure on, but there was no points on offer at that stage of the game. And then between the 10 and 15 minute marks of this game, we saw three tries. Yes, James Ram went over for the Saints to open their account. And then we saw a try from the Bulls to Hunnicombe. And then we saw Courtney Laws go over for the Saints. So quick succession, we saw some points being put on the board for both teams and the Saints went out to an early lead. So by the time we arrived at the 16th minute mark, it was 14 points to seven in favor of the Saints. The Bulls got a penalty kick then, so it was 14-10, and it was really game on because it looked like it uh, was pretty intense from both sides. Saints were playing well. They were just uh, executing a little bit incorrectly at times with drop balls and passes that went behind their men. But they did look dangerous, and if they were going to hold on to some of these, I thought the Bulls were going to be in trouble later on in the game. So in the second quarter of this game, heading up to halftime, we had four more tries, scored two to each team, in fact. And we saw Slightholm going in for the Saints first, and then Mitchell getting a try for the Saints, before Van der Merwe and de Klerk scored, scored for the Bulls. With all the conversions in place, we saw the score head out to halftime at 28 points to 22. And uh, there was really nothing into the in the game heading into half time. I did think this was going to be a question on how the reserve bench was going to be handled in this game and whether or not the Bulls would run out of energy in the second half and the Saints were able to come over top of them. So that's what I was looking forward to in the second half. Slight home was playing really well in that first half. Alex Mitchell was doing some really, really good stuff as well. But across the board, I thought the Saints looked very, very dangerous when they got the ball. But the Bulls were getting back into the game through their good forward play more than anything and uh, causing a little bit of havoc around the breakdown. So that's something that I was going to be looking forward to a bit more in the second half to see whether they could keep that momentum going. But then we came out in the second half and it was the Saints that clicked into gear in that first 10 minutes of the second half. They scored three tries. That's right, Ram, Coles and Dingwall went in for the Saints. 
No points on offer for the Bulls in that first 10 minutes of the second half. Against the Bulls, I thought they scored some really good tries. They looked dangerous and they looked fast in the back line. And that's what I'd said previously in the video, is that I thought the Saints were going to have too much speed and power in their back line for this Bulls outfit. And the Bulls defense was falling off. And uh, I won't say they were letting these tries in, but the, uh, the Saints were finding it fairly easy to get through this Bulls defensive line. Time we got to the 60th minute of the game, the Saints forward started to dominate the Bulls. They had a couple of crushing scrums, one ending up with a penalty, which uh, put the Saints further in the lead. But once the Bulls forward pack started to capitulate under the pressure of the Saints, there was only going to be one winner in this game. So in the last 15 minutes of the game, two more tries to the Saints. A good one to Mitchell and Augustus scored the last try for the Saints. They scored 31 points in that second half and the Bulls scored none. So that's where the game was won for the Saints. They came out and played a wonderful second half of rugby. They also played very well in the first half, but they really deserved it. They got all over top of the Bulls and uh, the Bulls just ran out of power, but they also ran out of class in that second half and the Saints were able to put some magical tries together. So with Smith missing the last conversion of the game to the Augustus try, the score ended up 59 points to 22 in favour of the Saints over the Bulls. A well-deserved um, uh, win there for the Saints. And I've got to say, it was good to see Jake White after the game going into the Saints dressing rooms and giving them a fairly motivational speech and telling them how impressed he was with the way that they played in this game. So good work, Jake White, for going in and doing that. Maybe a little bit of guilt about the players that he left behind in South Africa for this one. But let me know in the comments what you thought of this game between Northampton and the Bulls. A lot of you expected the Bulls to win this game, so I'd like to hear what you thought of the game. And uh, what do you think the difference was made between the Bulls players that were left at home for whatever reason and uh, those that travelled to play this game against the Saints? Okay, the last game of the weekend was played in sunny Toulouse between Toulouse and the Exeter Chiefs. Was looking forward to this one as well. A lot of you thought, myself included, thought Toulouse were going to run away with this game, but we had to wait and see. And I'll tell you what, in the first half, it was a completely different story because the Exeter Chiefs came with some real belief in this first half. A young team, of course, Exeter, and uh, playing very, very well. They got off to an early start of three points to nil, but then Intermac got into the game and uh, got over for a great try for Toulouse. The conversion was successful and they were up seven points to three. And at this stage, I thought, well, here we go. Toulouse is gonna open up the afterburners and run away with this game, but that's definitely not what happened at all. So by the time we got to about the 17th minute of the game and Slade had kicked a couple of kicks over, but Root had gone, Roots had gone in for a great try. We got Exeter out into the lead by 13 points to seven. So a great piece of work by Roots to get over and it looked like the Exeter Chiefs were able to take it to the forwards for Toulouse, which was a bit of a surprise to me. I thought the, uh, the Toulouse forwards would be all over the Exeter Chiefs in this game, but it wasn't the case early on in the game. They were, But in the 30th minute of the game, it was Toulouse's opportunity to take the lead in the game. It was Jack Willis who did a barreling run towards the line. But I've got to say, this try was set up by DuPont and also Kinghorn, who were playing a little bit of a magical interplay before the ball had got to Jack Willis. But he finished it off with a fantastic run to the line. And this was the opportunity Toulouse wanted to go into the lead as the first half was nearing an end. The score was 17 points to 16 at this stage. And I thought Exeter were playing extremely well to stay in this game. The question mark was going to be, could they hold on for the remainder of the game? And was the Toulouse bench going to make a big difference in this game? Or were we going to see a little bit of magical magic from that man, Anton Dupont, or even his number 10, Intermac? So we went to half time. It was 17 points to 16 in favour of Toulouse. Just one point in this game. Not many people would have picked that at half time. Exeter played very, very well in that first half. Roots had been having a good game. Willis was a standout for me on the Toulouse side. And Dupont was showing his magical little traits when he was doing little slip passes on the inside channels, causing all sorts of problems for the Exeter Chiefs. And I was wondering whether this was going to have a big impact as we got into the second half. But no one probably anticipated what was going to happen over the next 40 minutes of this game. And what happened over the next 40 minutes was outstanding. 47 points to lose scored 
and uh, the Exeter Chiefs were able to get eight in reply, but it was an outstanding second half, and what really happened was DuPont started weaving his magic around the inside channels, and this gave them the ability to get the ball out wide and use the wide channels, which they weren't able to any cause any defensive pressure from the Exeter Chiefs. And we saw Slade being one of the problems there. He was going for a miracle tackle all the time. And it enabled the wide man for Toulouse to get on the outside and cause all sorts of problems. Kinghorn was playing fantastic at fullback. Malia was having a great time on the wing. He scored two tries in this game. And it was really a dominant second half from Toulouse that just put the pressure all over Exeter. And Exeter were unfortunately not able to cope with it. Toulouse just turned on the afterburners in the second half. We saw some fantastic tries, but again, it was done through their ability to be able to win the ball in the breakdown. Emmanuel Mefu was absolutely enormous in this game for Toulouse. 150 kilos, this giant of a man. And not only was he doing some crushing bone rattling tackles in defense, but he was also getting in there and making a real nuisance of himself during the breakdown. And he, he was definitely one of the players of the match for me, Mefu. He had an outstanding game and he was able to really set up this ball for DuPont and the back line through the Toulouse team to be able to do their magic. Intermac was back for a second game, as I mentioned, since that horrific injury. He was starting to play some really good rugby as well before he was taken off. And R. Key was playing brilliant. No relation to Bundy, of course, spelt differently as well. But R. Key was playing very, very well at inside centre. But the whole back line for Toulouse came together in that second half. As I said, Malia played fantastic on the wing, scoring a couple of tries. And Blair Kinghorn, the Scottish fullback, of course, was very dominant at fullback, both with his kicking, but also with his injection into this back line. It was a fantastic display of rugby from Toulouse in the second half. And it was great to see the crowd smiling and singing in Toulouse. We're living in a world today which is absolutely terrible. A lot of depressive things around in the news, but we saw this fantastic game of rugby and the French crowd were at their very best, smiling and singing, lots of young kids in the crowd watching this great game of rugby. That's what it's all about. So by the time Malia had scored the final try of this game in the 77th minute, which went unconverted, the final score was 64 points to 26 in favour of Toulouse. And let's have a look at just some of the reserves they're able to bring on. Thomas Ramos came on, the French fullback, in the second half. Julien Marchand came on as well. They've got some incredible talent. Crew played absolutely fantastic when he came on. Flamand came on as well to uh, take over in the locking position. So they've got some real amazing test cap rugby experience to bring on in this Toulouse team. And it really showed in that second half. I've got to give a lot of props though to Exeter for that first half. I thought they played very well. They had a lot of self-belief. They tried to run around the Toulouse team and threw them and their forwards played very, very well in the second half. But it was like watching two games of rugby by the time we got to that second half. And uh, it was just magical spring weather rugby from Toulouse down there in France. So for me, standouts for Toulouse in this game, Kinghorn, Aki, Intermac and Dupont in the backs. Crew, Arnold, Mifu, of course, in the forwards. But Willis was the man that stood out for me in this game for the Toulouse team. Absolutely fantastic. Every time he looked the ball, got the ball, he looked very, very dangerous. Made some barging runs through the Exeter Chiefs defensive line. Jack Willis, absolutely fantastic in this particular game. Here we go, a fantastic quarterfinal weekend of Champions Cup rugby from Europe this weekend. And there were some brilliant games in amongst those and some brilliant plays. And I'm gonna go through some videos this week and talk about some of the players that are standing out in this year's competition. The finals are gonna be on the weekend of May 4th and May 5th. Don't miss these two games, they're gonna be fantastic. We've got Leinster first up against Northampton. That's gonna be played at Croke Park on May the 4th, fantastic. Let's see if we can get 80,000 people along to that one at Croke Park. And then the second game is going to be between Toulouse and Harlequins. And that's going to be played at La Stadium in France on May the 5th. So two brilliant games coming up in this year's semi-finals of the Investec Champions Cup. Now, of course, I'm going to be doing previews for those semi-finals as we get closer to those games. But I'd like to know in the comments of this video what you thought of this weekend's games. Let me know if you're one of those people that voted against the team that won their respective game and uh, let me know what you thought of the game. Who was the team of the weekend as far as you were concerned? 
like to hear that also from you in the comments. And who was the player of this weekend as far as you were concerned across the four games? I'd like to know a couple of names that you put forward to. So there we go. That's my wrap of the Invest Tech Champions Cup quarterfinals for this weekend. Fantastic four games of rugby. Hope you all enjoyed it. I look forward to bringing you many more videos in the not too distant future from lots of different rugby that's happening across the world. Until then, it's time to say adios from beautiful Cancun here in Mexico. You remember to stay well, stay safe out there, and also keep enjoying your rugby. Until next time, it's bye for now.